Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Today's topic is how to win a card license, the essential tips and tricks. For those of you that don't know, the card license stands for the Conditional Adult Use uh, Retail Dispensing License here in New York. These will be the first retail dispensary licenses released in New York State, the first 100 to 150. And they are a very specific conditional use license class for a very specific class of people. We are going to get into the application itself. We'll get into the eligibility requirements and what you need to know if you're qualifying for this application or you'd like to look at the application to see if you qualify. But before we do that, I wanna introduce my panel with me today. I'm joined by two gentlemen um, who do a lot of work in the cannabis space on different sides of it. I have David Fetner from Grow America Builders here. David's company uh, has consulted, designed, and built over 85 cannabis dispensaries across the country. He's worked with brand name companies uh, such as Verano, some mom and pops. He's worked with Ascend, GTI, and he's in the middle of a massive build out across the country. He's involved building out dispensaries and consulting and designing dispensaries throughout the country. David, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joe. This is great. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Got Andrew Meir here on the panel, who's been on panels here with us before. Uh, Andrew's a partner of mine with extensive proven track record in the cannabis space as a technical application writer. Uh, he submitted licenses or license applications rather in many of the legal jurisdictions throughout this country uh, and really has established himself as an expert in this space, not only when it comes to license application writing, but consulting and advising on legislation. Um, and he also is involved in projects across the country um, from a legislative perspective, a consulting perspective, and in an actual license application perspective. Andrew, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me again, Joe. So the card license. New York State, as I believe everyone on this call knows, legalized cannabis last year. And just because it legalized cannabis didn't mean that immediately there were dispensaries open on every street corner and everything was legal. It's legal to walk down the street and hold up to three ounces of cannabis on you. It's legal to walk down the street and smoke a joint. But the regulatory framework to govern how business in cannabis gets done, we're still waiting for. But we're inching forward slowly but surely. The first phase of this process was the conditional use licenses. Earlier this year, New York State released conditional use licenses for cultivation. For people who had grown hemp legally in New York State previously, they were able to click over and start farming full-blown cannabis. They've given out 250 of those so far, and they are already in process, seeds in the ground, process has begun. Cannabis processors, conditional use licenses have also been issued, about 15 so far. Also, prior hemp growers who were legally doing this in the hemp market in New York State previously have been allowed to now move into full cannabis marijuana THC processing. There are more applications in queue, but they've issued 15 already. The third piece of this is the most exciting, and that's what we're talking about today, and that's the card applications. These are your conditional use uh, retail dispensary licenses. Now, this group of licenses are going to go to people who are not previously licensed to sell hemp in New York. This specific group of licenses are going to go to people who have been just as involved. New York has been touting its very aggressive and progressive social equity program since the beginning. That was a main driving factor behind legalization in New York State. And this is the first instance where we're really going to get to see how it works. To be eligible for a card license, and the, the eligibility requirements are pretty specific, you must have either personally or have your spouse or a parent or guardian or a child or dependent must be justice involved. And to be justice involved, that essentially means that you must have had a cannabis charge in New York State at some point prior to March of 2021 when legalization occurred. It's not any charge and it doesn't apply anywhere out of New York State. We're going to spend a lot of time today talking about the eligibility requirements specifically because I believe that is where people are getting tripped up. 
it's a, it's a fantastic idea that the state is giving the first 100 or 150 licenses to people who are justice involved. I fully support that concept. What's not so great though, is the additional requirements on top of having had this cannabis charge that are gonna make this application very difficult to qualify for. If you do qualify, however, we wanna make sure that you get it. And that's the point of the webinar today. We're gonna to run through the eligibility requirements. We're gonna run through the application, um, pulling out some of the items that might be tricky to answer, break down some of the paperwork that would qualify as being acceptable should you submit it, and talk about the things that you don't have to submit right away. And then we're gonna move into talking about what happens if you do win, if you're successful and you win one of these dispensaries, then what do we do? So Andrew, let's start with you. From an application perspective, um, you've done a lot of application work throughout the country. Have you ever seen an application process quite like this one? No, Joe, I have not seen an application process like this. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time the government has supplied any type of applicant with A, a location, and B, kind of just a, a turnkey dispensary. Um, we've never seen anything like this. And I believe the effort is valiant on the state's end, and I see what they're they're wanting to do with this. But uh, yeah, the requirements are very strict for what they're asking. And uh, I, I do believe there will be some folks that qualify, but it definitely is a lot tougher than just a general application process. You know, normally through this process, um, even with just general social equity, um, it is mostly just a cannabis charge. There are no other uh, business requirements or business ownership requirements prior to applying. So um, to my knowledge, this is the first time any state jurisdiction or um, area of the country has done anything like this, um, even remotely close to this. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of what I've seen as well. Um, so so just to recap, if you qualify for this license class, um, and that is being a justice involved person, and we'll get into some of the other requirements in a moment, uh, there's good and bad to this license class. The good is that the state is actually going to identify a location for you. They're going to design and build out that location for you, foot the bill for it, and just hand you the keys to a dispensary that's ready to go. The bad is that you really don't have much of a say as to where this dispensary is going to be. And we'll get into this later in the program, but you can't pick your location. You can't design your location. You're going to have some you know, ability to add some input but you're not gonna to get to pick the spot that makes sense for you. You're not gonna be able to be on a block that you know would work perfectly. You're not gonna be able to be in your neighborhood necessarily. You could wind up somewhere else and, and maybe somewhere else that's not so close. So justice involved, we talked about, these are the low level cannabis charges to qualify. It's not any cannabis charge. It doesn't include federal cannabis charges. It's New York state low level cannabis charges. So we're talking essentially about the charges that are no longer illegal, more or less. Um, when we get into specific felonies, when we get into federal charges, those won't qualify necessarily for this. There are some that could potentially, but it's up to the board's discretion. But as a general rule, they won't qualify. So it's low level cannabis charges and they have to happen in New York State. If you lived in New York State at the time and you got a charge in New Jersey or in Connecticut or in Pennsylvania, you're out of luck for this particular application. Now you still could potentially qualify as a social equity applicant when the full license applications open next year, but for purposes of the card application, you won't qualify. Now, the nature of the charge is going to be a factor and also where you lived at the time of the charge is going to be a factor. The state is looking to basically right a lot of the wrongs from the war on drugs. The people who are adversely and unfairly affected and targeted, the people from those communities are going to be the people that are going to score more points for this particular question and are going to be given some degree of preferential treatment as they're going through the application process. Now, there are tons of people who have these low level cannabis charges and because of that, the state was concerned that they were going to get flooded with hundreds of thousands of applications uh, for this particular license class. So what they did in an effort to um, 
kind of vet that group and make sure that they're really only putting licenses in the hands of people who would know what to do with them is there is a second requirement on top of the justice involved piece. That second requirement is that 30% of the ownership group must be able to document that they have owned at least 10% of a business previously that can show a net profit for a period of two years minimum. So not only do you need this cannabis charge, but you also have to be able to show that you are or were a business owner whose business turned a net profit for two years. That's a pretty high bar. David, have you seen stuff like that I, before? I have not, um, you know, but I'm curious. Does that we've seen similar, you know, similar type of applications where part of the um, standards that they're looking at for points is based on, you know, the, the makeup of your team. How many people on your team have business experience? What type of business experience is it retail experience? Um, but I have a question the tent that the profit, the two years of profit, does do they have a um, restriction as far as when those two years were? Does it have to be in the last five years? Does it have to be in the last 10 years? Um, you know, could it have been two years, 25 years ago? I'm just curious on, on that. Yeah, so they originally did have it in a closer time frame and they did away with it. So they give you a little bit more flexibility now. Yeah, it doesn't have to be two consecutive good. years either. <laughs> right. Um, oh, okay. But what it can't be is yeah. it specifically can't be you owned one business and turned a net mm -hmm. profit and then you okay. owned another business and that turned a net profit. It's got to be the same business yeah. for two years. Right. And because that's, you know, the last few years have been hard on everybody. So, you know, I would think that'd be hard to show a couple, you know, last two years if that was a restriction. Yeah, that might have been why they relaxed this all together, yeah, yeah. frankly. No, I, I mean, I, I, again, I think in theory, every, it's great. It's great that the state is funding in this. It's great that, you know, they're opening it up to, you know, the people that, that were harmed, you know, by low, low level cannabis crime, which is, which is still, I mean, we got to get those people out of federal, you know, which is a whole nother story, but it's a good start. Um, and as far as the application goes, you know, we've seen applications in New Jersey and Illinois and Michigan and, you know, all over the country. The intent is, is very consistent with what we've seen. What you're talking about now, as far as the specifics is where, you know, that's where people really have to pay attention because that is a very specific that you have to have, you know, 30% of your group has to have ownership in a business. Um, and did you say it has to be retail? Or it could be any type of business. Any type of business where okay. it's considered a qualifying business, mm -hmm. um, but they're pretty relaxed with how they're defining qualified business. Yeah. You know, there, there's a list, and, and I've spent a lot of time on the portal helping people through the portal, and they give you a definition of qualified business, and it includes, you know, retail, hospitality, anything really consumer facing. And then there's sort of a little caveat in there that if it doesn't fall into one of those categories, you know, just let the office yeah. know and they'll make a determination because it's it's a pretty high bar. And and to your point, David, a lot of other jurisdictions um, we see with the social equity program that they have the the applicant have the the uh, responsibility to fill out an executive team or to fill right. out a board of directors with people with business experience. Mm -hmm. And I actually like that model because I feel like that creates an environment where there can be a degree of mentorship. You yeah. can have someone who doesn't have the business experience and they can be shepherded through by people who are sort of incentivized to do so because they're partners and they're all invested in the same operation. Here, you know, there's the state appears to be so... Um, concerned with empowering the applicants to make sure that they don't have to rely on anyone, no lawyers, no consultants, no nobody to help them get these applications through the door. Um, that my concern is that they're creating an environment where people are going to be isolated through this process. And that's what concerns me. Um, because then you're ultimately you're going to be in a situation where you have a license and you're not quite sure what to do with it. You don't have that network. You don't have that, you know, security blanket that you've created through bringing people onto your team that can assist. So, Andrew, does I know. Business, yeah. Andrew, I I know say, does the go ahead? Dave. Does it have to be a, a New York State business, or can it be any business around the country? Good question. 
It can be any business. It doesn't necessarily have yeah, to yeah. be a New York State business, but you know, mm -hmm. they want you to be living in New York. You had to get the charge right. in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. So with all those things, I think more often than not, it's going to be a New York business. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Andrew, you, you've worked on social equity applications yep. throughout the country. Um, talk to us about about that process generally in terms of you know putting the team together and and how important that is ultimately. Well, really, it depends on the uh, the jurisdiction that you'd be talking about because social equity programs vary very wildly across the country, right? Um, I remember, man, back in uh, the Illinois process, that has been rife with uh, you know folks being upset over that program due to what they allowed through social equity. Um, at one point, Illinois allowed you to hire essentially folks from uh, disproportionately impacted areas. And as long as they're on your team and being paid a minimum wage, you qualified as a social equity company. So the state of Illinois then touted that they had, you know, 90% of their or 85% plus of their applicants were all social equity, mm -hmm. when in reality, it was mostly companies just going into, um, you know, lower income areas and places that were hit harder by the war on drugs and hiring people for that process. So um, we've got things like that. We've also got, um, you know, where in like Nevada right now, you have to qualify with a census tract that has been affected by the war on drugs and have lived in that uh, jurisdiction or region for at least five years. So they vary wildly all across the United States. And um, based on this, the, 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 the business criteria that you need and the business acumen for this to run, I think is it's, it's a different challenge, but it's not impossible. Um, you know, in some cases, staying at one census tract for five years may be even more difficult than having a profitable business for two years that's not limited by any time frame. So in some cases, yeah, I think time is working against you in some cases on the social equity applications and other places. And uh, in this case, I would say the the business experience can can work against you on, on this one, but it can also be helpful. It really oh. just depends on your unique situation. I think you you also kind of kind of nailed it. You know, we're based here in Chicago, right? And so we're very familiar with the Illinois social equity program and the applicants. And you're right. I mean, it could be touted as you know 90% social equity, but you know, and I know, and most other people know, it's not truly a social equity program. I think what New York is doing here, you know, and the intent, and they are actually, it is going to be a pool of true social equity applicants. It's going to be righting some wrongs. Um, instead of, you know, what Illinois did, where it's just, a you know, a publicity grab for the most part, right. Saying, Hey, you know, we're, 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 we're doing social equity applications and, and, but that's not really when you lifted the hood, that's not really what it is in New York. That's, that is truly what it's going to be. And now we just have to make sure that, you know, the applicants have the right team around them. They're getting the right information, you know, from you guys that, Hey, we're going to put together the best possible application, but it really is going to be the right people getting these first licenses. I'd yeah. like to add on the uh, the social equity fund side of things, New York setting aside a fund that actually yeah. takes care of, you know, helping with uh, the initial costs because dispensaries can cost an outrageous amount of money to get started. Um, oh, yeah. What I saw was in, in Illinois specifically, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the application pool was so large of people, um, when I submitted the applications for the group I was working with, I was mm -hmm. sitting around a bunch of different families that were impacted by the war on drugs, and they were very hopeful but they also didn't really understand where the rest of their funding was coming from. They weren't sure if the building that they were interested in was going to remain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, COVID was happening. So the state didn't give anyone any loans or grants. Um, they basically just said, here's the application process. If you qualify, cool. But we have no idea how you're going to fund this and you need to figure it out. And to me, that's not really yeah. equity in any way. That's just kind of throwing somebody into a shark pit and hoping yeah. they come out. Of it. Right. Right. Right, thrown right to the wolves. Um, yeah, I mean, look, because, there's, uh, there's no question that New York has gone above and beyond to try to put the right people in position to be the first actors in mm -hmm. this state and yep. to try to do all that they can to support those folks. Yep. And part of it is is through this application process. And um, my my hope is just that they didn't make this so restrictive that they can't get enough applicants to fill these spots. And my hope yeah. is that the right people wind up with these licenses, which is, I think, what everybody wants to happen. So 
So we, we've talked about the justice involved piece of it. And the question is, how are you going to prove that? What does the state need to see? So if you're in the process of submitting a card application right now, or you're about to start the process, one thing you need to really work on is finding that certificate of disposition from that arrest and charge. It could be a pain in the neck. Um, some people have it in a file, easily accessible, great. If you don't, it could be a real pain in the neck. You might have to go down to the courthouse. You might have to go down to the police department. It could be a bit of a runaround to get that document, but you need it. And if you can't get a certificate of disposition, the state will work with you on alternative documentation, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. So if, if I were an applicant, the first thing I would do is I would go and secure my certificate of disposition. Now, you will likely be able to pick that up in the courthouse where you got your charge, in the county where your arrest was made. That will take care of the justice involved piece. Now we've got to talk about the business ownership piece. If you're applying because you qualify under the justice involved in business ownership um, part of this process, you have to submit proof of that net profit for that two year period. And that will be in the form of tax returns. So I would get on the phone with your accountant and source those tax returns or pull them out of a file if you have them somewhere. But that is what the state's going to require to uh, corroborate that you A, were justice involved, and B, you had uh, a business that you owned 10% or more of that turned a net profit. Now, you can show tax returns showing that net profit. You also need to show additional documentation for the company itself proving that you were a 10% owner or more. That would be in the form of a shareholders agreement, an operating agreement or your K-1 from when your taxes were filed, or other tax documentation. So you've got to show that you owned the right amount of the company, you've got to show the company had that net profit, and you've also got to show that you were justice involved. You need to have these receipts. Paperwork is going to be the key here. As you travel through the portal for this application, there are opportunities to upload paperwork after almost every question. And there's some of the paperwork that you need to supply at the time that you file your application. There's other paperwork that can wait for some point in the future to see if you make it to the next stage. Um, you're qualifying. Hey, Joe. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Um, when So the process, just so I, because it's, it's interesting for me to hear too, because I've seen you know, different states do it. So you're uploading in real time. The applicant is uploading in real time. Um, so as they're going, it's basically a, like a living document that is constantly being uploaded. It's not where you compile everything separately and then submit it all at once. It's constantly being being uploaded and your file is being created. And then is there a, a trigger point where you say, okay, this is it, this is final and it gets submitted or as you're doing it, it's always being reviewed and submitted? Yeah, it's a good question. So New York State has this thing called the uh, New York State Business Express Portal and all mm -hmm. the different state agencies use it for different applications. And the mm -hmm. Office of Cannabis Management is using it for these applications. Um, and what it is is, it's an online portal that you log into, you get a unique ID, you load in all your business information, all the information about who the owners are of that business, who the true people of interest are associated with that application. And you know, there's a number of sections of the application, let's call it 20. And every time you complete a section, it gets a little green check mark, you move on to the next section. You can save your progress at any time and come back in. So if you can't find that certificate of disposition right now, you can complete the rest of the application, save it, go back and upload it when you get it. So when you get to the end, when you're done with the entire checklist, you get to a review page. You can then review your whole application and you can electronically submit it. Once it's That's very user friendly. Yeah, it's pretty user friendly. Yeah. Um, once it's electronically submitted, you get an email with a unique ID associated with your application number. You then take that, print out that email, grab a check for 2000 bucks, throw it in an envelope and send it off to OCM. And then your application's complete and you wait to hear back. Great. So, yeah. you know, as I mentioned, there are parts of this application that are required to be submitted up front, or else the application will be denied for being deficient. Um, there are other parts of it that you don't necessarily need up front. You just need in the future. And I'll kind of go through what some of those are. So, you know, you don't get overwhelmed because it's, it's a pretty overwhelming process especially for people yeah. who've never done this before. 
So if you think you need all this stuff up front, you really don't need everything up front. So um, one thing, for instance, is um, the state asks you for a succession plan. If any of the you know, original true people on the application that are involved in day-to-day -day operations decide to leave the business, what's the plan for the future? Well, you don't even have the license yet, so most people aren't thinking about that. Mm -hmm. But that is one of those items that you can leave till the future. Yeah. They want to make sure the license is going to be in, in good hands if one of the original people leave. Now, mm -hmm. you've got, so you're an applicant, right? You know, you have to be 51% or more owned by justice involved individuals. That can be one person. That could be two people. It could be 10 people. doesn't matter. But 51% of the entity applying for the license needs to hit that justice involved qualification, meaning low level cannabis charge in New York state. Now of that 51% or more, 30% net total need to satisfy that business requirement. Not everybody does, just 30% of the ultimate ownership. But another item that's, that's interesting on the application is it asks you to identify someone who is considered to be the sole control principal. So even though you're a company, even though you might have 10, 15, 20 people associated, there is one person who has to be identified as the sole control principal. And that person needs to be justice involved and needs to have the business experience. So even though you can make up the rest of the company with whomever you want, you do have one individual who is considered the sole control principal who has to sign a bunch of affidavits and click a bunch of boxes affirming that they're in, they're in control, they control the company, they make the decisions. Um, and they have to satisfy both of the requirements to apply under the card license. So Joseph, now, you'd want to you'd want to start gathering your team around more so the one centralized person that would satisfy that first, right? Before you'd you'd start building that out. Would that be a a, a sound tactic? Correct. And you know, again, I appreciate why the state is doing this, but at the same time, it sort of dissuades people from wanting to invest and partner with people who qualify from the justice involved standpoint. Because when people meet each other, you know, generally they're gonna go into business together. They wanna share a lot of these responsibilities. Not everyone's gonna be looking to sign up for a situation where their partner gets to be the sole control principal. A lot of times, you know, companies should be a bit more democratic than that. But in this particular instance, you have to make the affirmation that that's not the case. You have one person who is sort of in charge. And it has to be the person that's justice involved and has the business experience. Now, Andrew, I'm sure you will tell us that one of the largest parts of applications in other states uh, is the financial component. Having yes. to show that you have the finances to actually get this project off the ground, having to you know, provide, well, why don't you tell us what, what you see in applications, what generally states ask for? Yeah, I mean, generally, um, states are going to ask for, obviously, your your pro formas, your projections to make sure the business is going to be profitable. Um, and that can be very, very different depending on the state, right? Sometimes they're going to ask for, um, you know, three-year, five-year projections. And in the case of, say, Las Vegas or Nevada right now for our lounges, um, they're only asking for a $250,000 uh, liquid proof. So all you have to do is just show that you have $250,000 liquid within your, your group that's easily accessible in the bank account, and it has to be all certified. So you have to make sure you get uh, the certification from the bank and make sure that all of that paperwork is in order prior to applying. But um, most of the time, they want to, or the state's intent for this most of the time, is they want to know that you have within your ownership group the ability to have the capital to pull this off. They don't want to give a license to someone that wouldn't be able to, to even get past their, their build out phase or their initial build out phase. And I'm sure David, you know, you'd want to make sure that uh, the clients you're working with also have the money to, to make sure that that gets done. It um, helps. If they're, it, it helps. if they're giving yeah. these licenses out and people can't act on uh, mm -hmm. building these things out or even supplying, you know, one to two years of, um, 
operational funds up front to make sure this business works, that's going to add more to the state's plate. And the less yeah. they can do, the better, right? They don't want to have to go back and figure out how to reissue licenses that folks can't pay for. So um, they're going to ask you a lot of the times uh, for these registered legal documents proving that you have funds. So um, yeah. that is Andrew, very, very common. Did, did you uh, work on applications in Ohio? Very briefly did. I have a family so, has a hemp farm out there. Okay. So Ohio, if I remember for their retail licenses, you needed to show a percentage of liquid assets um, based on how much the construction cost was. So I think it was, you had to show 20%. So, you know, if, if your construction, if your anticipated construction cost was $500,000, you had to show that you've got 20% liquid in the bank. Um, you know, I like the idea of just, you know, you said Nevada's just 250,000 straight up. Just show that fee. Yeah, right. So, right. So some States kind of have a, you know, and, and of course, you know, what that, what that does is, you know, it forces people to have as low construction costs as possible um, to be able to get the application, which sometimes may not be reasonable. I mean, we, we saw applicate, you know, winning applications come back to us say, okay, Hey, this was our construction cost for the, for the build out. And I'm looking at, I'm like, this can barely get you a vault and a security system. What, you know, who, who gave you this proposal? What happened here? And they said, oh, well, you know, we had to show, you know, X amount percentage liquid. And so I'm like, well, I'm like, okay, well, we need to kind of start from scratch here. So sometimes it forces the applicant to not be re reasonable or realistic. Um, so I don't know, you know, I don't, Joe, what is, what is New York showing? Do you, do you yeah, know what they so have to show to as far as so I, I started this, I started this conversation mm -hmm. because I found it really interesting that so many states require some degree of proof of liquid assets, yeah. right, as part of the application process. And New York might very well do that eventually. But what's interesting for these card licenses, because the state is taking on the process of going out and locating the actual site and picking up the tab for the design and build, you know, they're, they're planning to just give people licenses and not have them foot the bill for that stuff. So from a financial perspective, yes, you need to provide some degree of financial statements to the state. Um, you know, they ask for audited financial statements, but for new companies that have not been in business long, they're not going to ask for that upfront. They're going to allow you to provide bank statements or a letter from an accountant or something more informal to start with the promise of some degree of audited financials in the future, if you continue to qualify, but they really want to just make sure that you can cover whatever you're claiming the nut is. So they're basically asking you to lay out all the different expenses that you're going to have, who you're going to need to pay, how much, and then they're going to ask you to provide bank statements showing that you can cover it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to, there's not going to be a, a verification of a certain amount you know, necessarily liquid in the bank, you know, as a requirement, they're just going to make sure that you have access to the funds that cover the nut that you're designating you're going to need. And for these card licenses, that number is going to be very, very low, considering these licensees are not going to be paying for the, the design and build out of the space, right? That's, that's probably your biggest yeah. cost. If you had to cost out the whole process from, hey, I want to get a cannabis dispensary license to grand opening, your single largest cost is probably the design and build, I have to imagine. Yeah. Initially, so, yeah. So, you know, you're going to basically take that off the plate and it, it makes it a lot more accessible to people, which again, I completely appreciate. Um, my concern is just, and, and I'll share this with anyone, you know, looking at this seriously, just make sure you don't get into this industry and into this business unless you can afford to do it. And I'm not talking about anyone personally affording to just line up investors, line up sources of funds, because the last thing you'd want to do is get this amazing opportunity and then not be able to execute because you don't have access to the cash. So even right. though you don't need it up front, line it up anyway on the anticipation mm -hmm. that you're going to win and you're going to need it because anyone who qualifies, I really do want to see them be successful. That's what and I was going to say, on the build out. Yeah. Or just that there's so many ancillary costs too, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, yeah. and we're going we're gonna to talk about the build out in a second. just want to finish up on the, the actual application itself. You know, we spent a lot of time talking about the requirements because I think eligibility is going to be the biggest factor here. I think, you know, not only 
being eligible and being able to show the paperwork to make you eligible. Um, that's going to be the key to either winning or not uploading the paperwork to support those positions. And again, this is an application for people that fall into a very specific category who probably don't have the money to pursue these applications, but for this amazing program, which is going to put them in that position. And the give and take is that they give up being able to identify their own location. Now, throughout the application process, there's going to be an opportunity for applicants to designate what region they'd like to be in. And New York has carved up the state into 14 different specific regions. So someone can pick their top five regions they want to be in. Um, but there's no guarantee you get your first choice. And if you don't get your first choice, you don't get priority on your second choice location. You only get put into that pool if they don't have enough applicants to take dispensaries in that pool. And it keeps trickling down once you get, you know, through your first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier, you know, you could wind up with a dispensary in Rochester and you live in Long Island. And that's a heck of a commute. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty interesting to see how this whole thing, um, this whole thing works out, but let's, let's talk about, um, you know, we already started talking about it, but let's talk about that design and build that dispensary. Let's talk about, yeah. you know, what people need to be thinking about when they're looking at spaces or, you know, for the people that do win these licenses, while, you know, someone's footing the bill for the design and build, I understand they'll have a degree of input. So Dave, why don't you talk about, you know, what you look for in a space and what people should be paying attention mm -hmm. to? Well, first, you know, one of the biggest frustrations we find from clients all over the country is finding the property. You know, it has to be a Goldilocks zone, right? It has to be, you know, certain distance from, you know, a daycare or school or, a, a, you know, house of worship. Um, it has to be in an area that's been pre-approved by the town, right, to be in that cannabis, whether it's an overlay district or whatnot. And, you know, it has to be a landlord that is okay with cannabis and it has to be um, an area that is good for location, right? So like you have, we call it like the Goldilocks green zone. The fact that the state's taken all that heavy lifting out, I think is, is just a huge burden off a lot of people. We have so much frustration from clients in New Jersey and in Michigan and Ohio, where they can't find the right piece of property. And once they do, there's a bidding war between three other four or five other cannabis companies wanting to take it over. So that's huge. Um, once that property is located, what we look for like in, as an ideal site um, is usually a storefront location, right? Like in a strip mall, because um, you know you're gonna have good power. You know that you're going to have good water, gas. Um, you, this is not cultivation, so you don't need to have a lot of it, but you still need to have you know, some, some good infrastructure. Um, also, we like a, a freestanding building that may be, um, you know, an outbuilding in a, in a, in a mall, um, like an old restaurant, like a, an Applebee's type restaurant, um, uh, Shake Shack, those types of buildings are great. You can demo them out, build them out very nicely. You can reutilize, you know, some of the, maybe the flooring um, or some ceiling grid. So we look at properties that will have a quick and easy build out timing wise, because first to market is always huge in cannabis. Um, and we look at them that have good infrastructure all ready to go and have ample parking. And once you locate those, you know, it's, it's really go time with, you know, figuring out what your aesthetic is and your schematic design, and then, you know, going into architecture. But you really want to find something that, that makes itself as easy as possible to, to fit it out and to build it out. So let's talk about timing for a second. Yeah. So here we are mid-September. The application mm -hmm. window for the card licenses is open. It'll be open for another 10, 12 days or so. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be reviewing all the applications. They're not, mm -hmm. you know, reviewing on a rolling basis. They're going to wait for everyone to be submitted. And then they're going to take okay. stock of, of the whole, the whole pot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the state is in the press talking about how um, they think there'll be sales before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So applications yeah. need to be reviewed first then sites mm -hmm. need to be identified, yeah. then designer builders need to be engaged yeah. and they need to build out the spaces. So, so talk to me about um, timeline yeah. from you know, when you as a design build guy get engaged to when you could realistically hand the keys to somebody. So again, it really depends on the, the building or the space, right? That's why I always say we try to look at something that is as easily you know, retro, 
renovation wise to be retrofitted or just built out as quickly as possible. So really, if you're looking at like a storefront location, right, storefront location that is basically a, a vanilla box. So which means you have the exterior walls all drywalled and you have to do all the interior walls, interior fit outs, custom mill work. At the best case, um, at the best case, you're talking about maybe a six week schematic design to architectural permit set, right? Construction documents. And then, you know, permitting process, depending on the town will take a small town, maybe a week, a big town, maybe eight weeks, right? Depending on how long it takes for that. Um, so let's say it takes a week. So let's say you have a good municipality. You look at it. There's not a lot of comments. Um, a typical storefront build out of maybe 2,500 square feet could be about eight weeks. Okay, so you're right in that timeline. Let's say a property is found, you know, in the next few weeks. If you go as fast as you can with construction documents right into construction, you are talking best case at the end of the year. Um, this is an illegally bonding document, is it, um, okay. Joe? This is this no. is okay. We can we can delete, but you know, yeah, because yeah, the builder yeah. always says, you know, under under promises over performance yeah. is the key. But sometimes we over promise. And but I mean that that is what we've seen. You know, we did some storefronts on the East Coast, and we got them done in about eight weeks. Um, but you know, you're, you're pulling in some, you know, double time hours, um, but you want to get it done. You know, we work in States where there's deadlines. If you don't get up and operational, you have your license taken away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, there's going to be a lot of overtime work. There's going to be some nighttime hours that are going to be worked to get these things done. Um, can all 150 be done by, you know, end of the year, that seems very ambitious, but I do think there should be some that can get up and operational, you know, by year's end, but it, it really depends on, on what's being handed over as far as the property, right? If, if yeah. it's a dilapidated building full of mold and hazardous materials and it's falling apart and it needs exterior work and new parking lot, different story rather than something that's, you know, a vanilla box in a, in a little strip mall that's ready to go. Got it. And Andrew, do you have a sense of timing from when an application window opens to like a traditional review time? Right. That also, oh my God, that's such a big window of time. Uh, typically, though, um, it's not, it, it doesn't get done within a month, if that's what you're asking. So, um, you know, in this case, end of September is when the applications are being submitted for review. It really depends on how many they get. If they only get 200 applications that come through, I'm sure they can get through it pretty quickly, but to do review on uh, business structures and looking up, um, you know, how many years of fo uh, folks have had a business and looking up financial documentation and making sure that all of this is legitimate, it takes time. So it really depends on the state's approach. Um, you know, are they hiring out consultants to actually look over all of this information? I know in, in a lot of the states, um, they'll hire a third party that needs to be trained on their application process process to actually grade these and score the the criteria properly. So um, like I'll go back to Illinois again, because it is one of the markets I think is comparable to New York size wise. Um, they hired a third party mm -hmm. that took forever to get it done. And yeah. then it honestly, man, I, when it, it took us like six, six to eight months to know our like results and actually get it in writing and, and having a license on the wall. So it can take forever um, in, in, in some cases, but I'm, I'm really hoping New York uh, plays their cards right and learns from other states to, to move this process along quickly. Yeah. Based on what I've seen in the past, um, end of the year is very, very aggressive. And based on how New York has operated thus far with getting regulation sets out um, kind of slowly, um, I don't see many of them opening by year's end, but like David said, I'll, I'll echo that. I could see a couple of them opening um, if the build out's quick. Yeah. And I think, look, I think for a conditional use class of license like this is, there are not going to be that many that are applying and they are going to be incentivized to get them reviewed quickly. I still don't see 30 days being realistic. I would think maybe something more like 60 makes sense. Um, but the nice thing here is, uh, considering the state is identifying these locations and building them out, you know, on a parallel track with reviewing the applications, it's not like they're going to hand out these awards and then people are going to start the building process. I think the idea yeah. is people are going to get these mm -hmm. rewards 
and they'll have a location that's already in the process of being built out. So it's yeah. not doing one thing than the other. It's kind of running them down, you know, in parallel. So, so that should be helpful. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I bet you that is going to be the situation. It's, it, it's such a unique program. Um, there's really no blueprint for it, but you're right. If parallel to them reviewing the applications, the state's already started on the design process, you know, and maybe even, you know, started a little bit, of, then yeah, that's, it's a lot more doable than waiting to approve all the applications. And yeah. then, yeah. And it's realistic. And, and look, I think ultimately the state's plan is obviously to pay attention to these card applications and card licenses and get them up and running. That's a big part of the plan, but there is also the, the full license process and the full license portal and the full regulatory package, which we're still waiting on, which, you know, we hope to see in Q1 of 2023. And I think part of this is New York wanting to kind of roll through showing progress, you know, to take us right through when they're ready to go with that. So, you know, I'm hoping to see a full regulatory package, at least a draft of one, you know, I'm projecting at some point later in the fall. Um, and then a 60 day comment period. And then hopefully we wind up in a place where we roll through, you know, the card application license uh, awards into places opening towards the end of the year, potentially into January. And then boom, we roll into, you know, finalized regs and, you know, a finite timeline for the, the full cannabis licenses in New York, which is something that people have been waiting for for years now and the goalposts keep moving. But I feel like we're close. I feel like, you know, New York State started a machine here that they can't unstop. And this conditional use program with the cultivation, with the processing, now with the card licenses, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't stop that. Because yeah. if you do, you, you risk potentially collapsing the whole industry and not really giving anybody a shot. So that's no, a rolling stone. Yeah. yeah. So we, we certainly have started that process and, and I'm excited to see where we go. Um, and I think on uh, Joe, on the timelines here, one thing that concerns me as an operator and somebody that, that writes out standard operating procedures and plans for compliance with the, the rules and regulations in these states um, what are we doing as far as, you know, getting people trained and into these facilities, you know, I, the, the three month timeline for, you know, build out and getting it ready to go and being open by year's end, you know, sometimes training programs are you know, a, a week at the, the absolute least and, and, and longer, if you have a, a, a set team that really needs to know a lot and in a brand new market where nobody has uh, sold I don't want to say anybody, but there's been medical program. But when when a, a vast majority of the employees coming into the workforce haven't dealt with uh, the same type of compliance issues that cannabis brings, are we going to have staff that are are trained up and ready to go? And um, are are the operators even going to be ready to deal with the compliance challenges that quickly to be operational? Well, Andrew, I'll, I mean, are we going to have product? The are other, we going to have uh, product? And how good is that product going to be? You know, we've got a lot of first timers producing this first wave of product. And I don't have to tell you guys what that usually ends up like after your first harvest. So, oh, the first, right. we, yeah. So, you know, it, it's there are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of assumptions, I think, that the state has made and they've been very optimistic. And look, I hope that they all work out. Um, I think the, the important thing, you know, for me and I think for us is just to keep doing things like this, keep doing educational programs, keep you know, getting out there, talking to people, letting people know that while they don't necessarily need any help to put the application in, and the state has made such a big point about people can do this themselves. At some point, people do need assistance. At some point, people do at least need, you know, someone to make an introduction to people who have done this yeah. before, who can be mm -hmm. a good resource for them. Um, no one can do anything themselves as well as they can do it if they had someone who's got a degree of experience um, helping them along the way. And, and we'll just keep putting ourselves out there and, and try, to, try to help to support this program and New York State legalization in general the best that we can. I think what you're doing on something like this, just trying to put people in the best position possible to win the license, right? That's, yeah. I mean, that's, you, you want to be in the best position possible where you kind of have all your I's dotted, your T's crossed, you have all the docs. In, and, and I bet you there's a lot of people on here that, that didn't realize half of the things. I mean, I didn't know some of these things. There's some things that are very specific 
to this application, right? Like yeah. 30% business interest and the two years profit. And so I think that, you know, just getting people in the best position to win the, to win the license. Yeah. So, so look, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so we'll open it up to, to Q and A's if anyone has them. There's a chat box. If anyone who's attending this webinar wants to uh, have us answer a question, please feel free to throw in the chat box. Um, once we're done with some Q and A's, we'll we'll close this thing out today. I actually had a question, Joe. Um, based on the name of this webinar and how to win a license, to put people in the best position to win a license, I was looking over some of the scoring criteria, and there is essentially a portion of factors that are weighted more heavily in the application scoring than other sections, right? Mm -hmm. So. It's saying here specifically that if you have a charge yourself, it kind of cascades down on the priority list of what point allotment you're going to get. Obviously, they haven't released a scorecard, so we know exactly what we're getting. Um, you know, and depending on where you were arrested, like you're saying earlier, places that are impacted by over policing and mass incarceration, um, that will actually affect your score. So, how can you, before you put all this time in? The investment of the the fund to make the application happen, as far as the 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 application fee, how can you, as an applicant, know that you're going to be in your best possible position before uh, you know going down this road? I know we don't have a lot of time left in the process, but if you were planning and you're right on the fence, what would be your suggestion to look into? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. We touched on it a little bit earlier. It, it matters where you got arrested. It matters for what. It matters who got arrested. It matters where you lived at the time. All of that stuff matters. All of that stuff matters. And, and you need to have your paperwork in order. The, the more concrete paperwork you can provide, the better it's going to be. If you, don't also, have a, if you don't have that certificate of disposition, you have to do an affidavit and do some other things like that's probably not going to weigh as heavily. I'm seeing here qualifying business experience, specifically talking about, um, you know, being familiar with compliance related issues. So if you have a business that's already uh, working with the state on compliance, if you have uh, say anything in the, the alcohol or liquor realm, you may be um, a, a better candidate according to the state based on uh, those types of businesses, uh, retail specifically, since this is a dispensary. At the end of the day, dispensary, um, a dispensary really is just a retail storefront with more rules. Um, instead of selling clothes, you're selling marijuana. Correct. And, you know, again, the qualified businesses, I do believe they will weight more heavily. Things like you said, Andrew, things in hospitality, things with a already a regulatory license and a good track record, more so than businesses that are not so consumer facing. Um, so I think that's another good point. Um, I see a question here in the chat you stated that New York State has split the state into 14 regions. Has New York State determined how many locations licenses will be allowed per region. Yes, they have. Um, New York State is operating off of the assumption that um, they're going to give out 150 card licenses max. That doesn't mean they're going to give out 150. That means they'll give out as many as 150. And they did break it down by region. And there's a link to it on the state website um, under the, the resources section, they break down, they show you a graph that shows you how many max will be per region. So like Manhattan, for instance, is one region. Um, and I believe it's 22 is the max. I think That's Brooklyn correct. is 18. I think Staten Brooklyn Island is 19. Is so yeah, the resources out there and they, they have actually decided what the max is per region. Got another question here. Um, does a company LLC have to be open prior to submitting the application or is the applicant able to open the new organization after the license is given? Good question. Um, the preference is that the company is open prior to filing for the license application because the changes you'll have to go through after the fact can be quite sticky um, to transfer the license from you know, a sole proprietor to a business or from one business to another. So I highly recommend um, forming the entity in advance. And again, 
this is just the card license application portal that's open right now for the people that qualify. Anyone looking to get a liquor license, a liquor license, a cannabis license that uh, does not meet the criteria for the card license, those are going to open shortly. I think it also shows that you all your ducks in a row, right? You've got the LLC set up. You have your organizational um, procedures. You have your your whatever it's you know your board of directors or you have your LLC members. It just shows you have everything in order. You know, in other states, we know the states will want to see. You know, okay, they this group they've got their act together, right? They've got everything ready to go, and that's gonna that's gonna have some weight in it also. Right. And to Andrew's point earlier about how do we amass points, I think the most complete applications will do the best. While yeah, there are yeah, certain yeah. things that you don't necessarily need to provide up front that you can only provide, you only provide later if you get there. I think the more you can provide up front, the more complete your application is, the better off you're going to yeah. be. And to your point, David, it it makes you look more buttoned up and ready to go. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Um, based on my experience, as much as the states like to be 100% objective with this, you are still dealing with humans behind the applications that are grading them. Mm -hmm. So things that are easy to read, things that are easy to uh, detect if they're looking for something specific, don't bury it in a bunch of text. Um, if they're asking you for specific documents, don't upload things that aren't needed to be uploaded. Um, they're going to give higher scores from what I've seen in the past to folks that, um, you know, are buttoned up, like you're saying, uh, David. Yeah. We have another question here. Has New York released any information on edibles, like a, an edible cannabis restaurant, for instance? Well, New York is going to have social consumption um, locations as part of the, the regulatory package that comes out and the licenses that will open next year. Um, however, the current version of the rules does not provide for an environment where you're going to be able to infuse your own food. It will be more like, think of a, you know, old timey tobacco store. You come in, you buy a cigar, you go in the back, you smoke it, you leave. So you'll be able to come in um, and buy some edibles and eat them in the place. Uh, but you're not going to, you're not going to have that Amsterdam style cafe. Another question here, if the state's going to find locations, design and build the space and fund these applicant winners, their determined value, they'll be given uh, the applicant winners. Not sure of the question, but if the question is um, how valuable is a design and built out store, um, David, off the top of your head, average cost of a design and build dispensary um off the top of my head about eight hundred thousand, give or take depending on size and right final scope but give or take cool all right that's all i see there it's four o'clock we'll call it quits gentlemen thanks for joining me today um anyone who tuned in appreciate you guys doing that and if you have any other questions feel free to shoot us a note uh, offline. And we're always happy to chat about this stuff. For sure. And good luck to everybody. And uh, thanks for having me, Joe and Andrew. I'll see you guys real soon. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye everybody. Take care.